Euro Max Highlights. And here's your host, Megan Lee. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our highlight show with the best picks of the week. Here's a look at what's coming up. Reach for the Skies, presenting a new Alpine restaurant by architect Mario Botta. A kind of magic, German illusionists do their stuff in Bonn. And night and day, enjoy the hustle and bustle of Berlin's Kudam Boulevard. The signature works of Swiss architect Mario Botta are scattered around the world. They include San Francisco's Museum of Modern Art, the Cathedral in Evry, France, and the Samsung Museum of Art in Seoul. Red bricks are his trademark, and at the age of 73, he's just added another structure to his repertoire, the Fiore di Pietro restaurant in Switzerland. Now it's perched some 1,700 meters on Monte Generoso, like a flower overlooking the valley. Monte Generoso in the Swiss canton of Ticino has a new landmark. The Fiore di Pietra, which means stone flower, is perched at a lofty altitude of 1,700 meters. Its world-famous architect Mario Botta has come to give his official blessing to the octagonal restaurant with its panoramic views. The Swiss architect was inspired by the form of the mountain. I wanted to do justice to two different sides of the mountain. One of them, which faces south, is very pretty. The other is north-facing and is craggy and steep. I could do that via this big terrace and then the building at its end. The stone flower grows out of the geometry, the topography of the mountain. Construction work took almost two years. Working at that gradient and altitude was a big challenge. The building cost almost 19 million euros. You can eat inside the Fiore di Pietra and you can drink in the scenery on the terrace. Every last detail was designed by Mario Botta. The architect chose gray stone for the external cladding, designed to mirror the mountain itself. The stone stands for the mountain. I like the thought that architecture doesn't mean that a building occupies a place. Instead, the building becomes a part of the place. Mario Botta grew up in Switzerland and studied architecture in Italy. In 1970, he set up his own office. Over the years, he has worked on 800 projects all over the world. One of his most famous works is the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which opened in 1995. Botta is a master of bold geometric forms and likes to use materials like stone and concrete, as he did in Tel Aviv's Symbolista Synagogue and Jewish Heritage Center. Typical of his architectural handwriting, the red brick and round form of Evry Cathedral in France. Everyone writes as best they can. Picasso's signature is unmistakable. You just need to see two single strokes. Garcia Marquez wrote a number of novels, but his language remained the same. I think that my style is very autobiographical. Mario Botta's monumental architectural style has had the greatest impact on his home canton of Ticino, where he's best known for his ecclesiastical buildings. The church of San Giovanni Battista in the mountain village of Monio has striking black and white stripes and attracts lots of tourists. Botta hopes that the Fiora di Pietra will be just as popular. It's a project that's particularly close to the architect's heart. After all, he grew up near Monte Generoso and frequently enjoyed its panoramic views over the border to Italy. As a child, the mountain was the world for me. The peaks, the Alps, the entire universe. I climbed up the mountain in the early morning to see the sunrise. This mountain let me see the world. 
On April 8th, the Funicular Railway will start to carry visitors up the mountainside to the new building. That's when Mario Botta's Fiore di Pietra opens its doors to the public. The new landmark certainly faces stiff competition. The panoramic views from Monte Generoso. When I was a kid, I had the opportunity of seeing one of the most successful illusionists of all time, David Copperfield. Now, this was a few years before he became famous, so the venue was small, but his magic tricks were amazing just the same. He made everything disappear right before your eyes. Animals, cars, even his assistants all vanished into thin air. And like most magicians, he's never revealed his secrets, so it all still remains a mystery to me at least. <laughs> well, magicians like Copperfield and Houdini before him have paved the way for the next generation of illusionists to take to the stage. A magician and a lamp that does far more than just shine. Patrick Lenin worked on this trick for a good four years, fine tuning the set, the music and staging. It genuinely touches people and affects them deep down. You don't just watch and think, that was an amazing magic trick. It really touches and moves you and evokes real emotions. The audience soon is charmed by the brazen little lamp. When 34-year-old Patrick Lenin isn't bringing objects to life, he's working at his day job as a programmer in Cologne. He built and wired his magic lamp himself. It took a lot of work. This is a diagram for the internal wiring. It's pretty complicated. The diagram alone took me a year to complete, and it's still working. I tinkered with this trick for three years before I got it to where I could perform with it. I took it to the theater without knowing how it would come across. Would people like it? Was it only fantastic in my mind or not? Then I got a standing ovation and knew. Great. It worked. Knowing how to juggle helped him learn to perform magic tricks. For both, you need extremely nimble fingers. In 2006, he saw some ingenious card tricks on the internet and started imitating them, until he had them all down pat. That's when I caught the bug, and I tried to learn absolutely everything I could find about card tricks. Not with the intention of performing, but just for myself, for the challenge, and to pass the time. <laughs> In his search for new card tricks, he visited magic stores and got to know other magicians and new types of tricks. He and fellow Magic Circle members are currently busy organizing Bond's Magicians Festival. The best conjurers from near and far cast their spells in various categories. I worked on my manipulation act as it is now for nearly five years. That's perfectly normal, because it takes years to learn the basics. These moves, for instance, this is a very typical move for manipulators. The large-scale illusions require a team of assistants and lots of space. Flick Flack Modern Magic from Landau have won the German championship twice so far with their self-built magic machines. Timing is critical for a large-scale illusion. It has to fit the music precisely so everyone knows just what they have to do. It takes a lot of practice. You have to rehearse it over and over until you've got it right. One favorite large-scale illusion is the good old sawing a woman in half trick in endless variations. There are so many incredibly good magic acts. 
And not only do they have the magical element in common, they also need something special. Sometimes it's the character that's so fascinating that it makes you want to watch it every time. Sometimes it's a special effect that's so astounding that you can't look away. And sometimes it's the story that's so thrilling. And that's a good description of Patrick Lenin's magic lamp. He's created his own form of magical poetry. And it's a shining light in the mysterious world of magic. It's considered one of the best orchestras in the world and boasts a 175-year history, the Vienna Philharmonic. Now, its history can be divided up into eras, the first being the golden era under conductor Hans Richter, who helped the ensemble achieve world-class status. Well, the early 20th century saw the orchestra tour Europe and the world under famous conductors and composers such as Richard Strauss and Gustav Mahler. Later, National Socialism would leave a brutal mark on the orchestra, driving its Jewish members into exile or even to concentration camps. After World War II, the Vienna Philharmonic continued its policy of working with every reputable conductor on the planet, making it Austria's most highly coveted cultural export. For 175 years, they've been doing their thing. A group of self-confident musicians who choose their own conductor for every concert. As soon as you are Vienna Philharmonic, you are a member of their club. And uh, they treat each other that way. And uh, for me, it's, it's a great... Uh, passion or every time I come. The most wonderful gift a conductor can receive is to play with this orchestra that completely owns this music and that is nonetheless prepared to rehearse it with openness and curiosity. The orchestra's founder, Otto Nikolai, lived in this house. Today, it's home to an exhibition about the orchestra. The Philharmonic Orchestra was born in 1842 when the Vienna Court Opera gave its first symphonic concert. Franz Bartolome was the Vienna Philharmonic's principal cellist for almost 40 years. His father played violin there and his grandfather was a Philharmonic clarinetist in the 19th century. Everything that still characterizes the Vienna Philharmonic has its roots in those times. Back then, all these insanely brilliant composers were still living, and my grandfather was in the middle of it all. He knew Brahms, Bruckner, Johann Strauss. The Vienna Philharmonic has performed the world premieres of many famous works. The orchestra had a close relationship with the composer Gustav Mahler. Then, as now, the Philharmonic musicians play their symphonic concerts in Vienna's Musikverein. But they're also the house orchestra of the Vienna State Opera. As a member of an opera orchestra, you are constantly confronted with the most natural of all instruments, the human voice. And so an opera orchestra will always respond and hear differently. An opera orchestra simply sounds different. Clemens Helsberg, first violinist and long a member of the orchestra's executive board, has written a book about the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. He thoroughly researched the archives and publicized a dark chapter in the famous orchestra's history. Das the period from 1938 to 1945, if it wasn't suppressed, it was dealt with as briefly as possible. An extremely high percentage of the orchestra members joined the Nazi party. After World War II, Herbert von Karajan began conducting the Vienna Philharmonic. When Franz Bartolome joined in the 1960s, stars like Carlos Kleiber and Leonard Bernstein stood on the podium. Bernstein had this explosive conducting. With Karajan, there was this rich coloration in his gestures. Of course, I was awestruck. That was clear. But I had the feeling that he was there for me. 
that if I needed him, he would watch out for me. Wenn ich ihn brauche, passt er auf auf mich. All the great conductors have had a turn conducting the Vienna Philharmonic's New Year's concert. Every January 1st, its waltz potpourri is broadcast in 90 countries. That has made the Vienna Philharmonic an internationally recognized brand and made the musicians proud. First, it's a huge export item. Second, it's world famous because the New Year's concert is broadcast all over the world. These things make Austria shine. I'm convinced that that's important. Tradition, joy, internationality. Internationalität. There are outstanding orchestras in the world, but there is only one Vienna Philharmonic with its specific sound. Schubert, Lana, Schrammel, Strauss, they lived this Vienna sound. It doesn't aim at perfect precision, but at producing musical moments that speak to the heart. When we play music, we have to open our hearts and be willing to let our souls speak. Die Seele sprechen zu lassen. The Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra may be 175, but its unique sound is ageless. It's hard to predict what will be trending next on the internet. And sometimes it's babies singing in the backseat of a car or cats chasing virtual mice on an iPad. But another trend right now is quite unusual. Unicorns have become the unofficial mascot on numerous social media platforms. And one fashion designer in Hamburg is taking advantage of the trend to make and market clothing and, and accessories. Once upon a time, a mythical creature appeared suddenly like magic in the consumer world. The unicorn. There's hardly a marketing campaign that can do without it. Fashion designer Susanna Weber-Euler is a unicorn aficionado. She's been using unicorn motifs since she established her designer label, Oh Yeah, a year ago. It didn't matter to her that some friends were skeptical. How can you put a unicorn on a sweater? That's kid stuff. My daughter has a unicorn t-shirt with glitter in pink. It's childish. But we answered, we're doing it anyway. We felt it had to be the unicorn. I wanted a unicorn sweater myself, and it sold like hotcakes. The sweaters are now best sellers among customers of all ages. And the unicorn is the Hamburg-based label's colorful trademark. A unicorn is independent and free. It's special, not like any old brown horse. It's a superstar among the animals. It's something extraordinary, magical, unpredictable, and it's strong but sensitive, characteristics many people can identify with. Animals, including mythical beasts, occasionally capture the popular imagination. A few years ago, it was owls. They were edged out by flamingos. And now the whimsical unicorn is breaking all the records. The moment the public embraces a mythical, symbolic creature, the creature acquires a unique type of power, and the trend endures longer than if it simply came from the design or fashion industry. Last December, a German chocolate maker brought a limited edition of unicorn candy bars onto the market. They sold out in a single day and now trade for many times their original price on the internet. Offering them as a limited edition made them desirable. It's something special, an exception, just like a unicorn is not associated with a herd. And suddenly, product marketing saw an advantage in harnessing the power of the myth itself. To be able to see unicorns and even eat something so special, that's available to only a select few. But then during this year's carnival season, herds of unicorns appeared after all. Everyone wanted to be a unicorn for a day. The costumes sold out fast in many places. A little bit of glitter and happiness never hurt anyone. 
It's no coincidence that the unicorn is so popular at a time when there's so much uncertainty in society. The unicorn is a fairy tale creature. It bestows strength, emphasizes goodness, and lets the impossible seem probable. Unicorns inspire us to flee into a fantasy world in which absolutely anything can become something enchanting and sweet. This YouTube video became an instant hit, receiving 30 million clicks in two years. Susanna Weber-Euler believes the unicorn will be with us for a while. Although her next collection will also feature unicorn sweaters, she's got her eye on new motifs. So what's coming next? I suspect it'll be mermaids. They're also really special and have some serious powers. Magic is what it's about. Everyone's enchanted by magic. You don't say. And the hype is already starting. Nymphs and mermaids are the next mythical creatures that will soon be making a big splash on store shelves near you. Most major cities have a main boulevard that are key to their character. Paris has the Champs-Élysées, Barcelona has La Rambla, and Berlin has the Kudam. And that is where you will find some of the most exclusive shops in the western part of the city. The Kudam has long been a major part of Berlin's ever-changing history, so we met up with a local resident for a tour. The Kurfürstendamm starts on the southwestern edge of the Tiergarten Park. From the famous Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche, a bombed out church and major landmark, it stretches some three and a half kilometers west to Rottenauplatz. The Kudam, as it's called, is known primarily as a major shopping mile, but it's also living, breathing Berlin history. The Wolfer family is part of that heritage. Martin Wolfer is the third generation of his family to run the street's famous theater complex. For theater people like us, being on the Kurfürstendamm really is something special. You get a lot of walk-in customers, and it's always busy. It's Berlin over the decades in a microcosm. Martin's grandfather took over the reins of the Theater am Kurfürstendamm and Commedia am Kurfürstendamm in 1934. The two stages have repeatedly won rave reviews for their popular productions. Both were founded over 90 years ago by legendary theater director Max Reinhardt. They were built by Max Reinhardt to be the first comedy theaters in Germany. He got the idea from London and Paris, big city theater for big city dwellers. But there is the odd island of tranquility amidst all the hustle and bustle. This square is named after pioneering Dada artist Georges Gross. Recently, there's been a big effort to redo the squares and corners on Kurfürstendamm, and this is a good example. Closing off this little street here has livened up the place and its cafes and restaurants, and I like it. The further west you go, things start to quiet down. There are fewer shops here, and there's even one of the front gardens left. Every house used to have them. The Saturday Farmer's Market at Leninerplatz is worth a visit. It's a meeting point for real Berliners who live on the Kudam. Increasingly, owners are trying to rescue old structures. Take Cumberland House, for example. It fell into a state of disrepair, but renovations in the last five years have returned it to its rightful role as one of the avenue's stateliest buildings. The coffee shop on the ground floor, which has eight-meter-high ceilings, underwent a lavish refurbishment. The Kurfürstendamm was badly damaged during the Second World War. Few of the original buildings remain. Martin Wolfer grew up on the boulevard, and he's seen a lot of changes. 
The Kurfürstendamm is genau the Kurfürsten the same as any other place in Berlin, constantly in motion. Nothing stays as it is. It's like that here too. This area of the Kudam used to be home to cinemas and cafes. In the 80s and 90s, this was a kind of center of cinema culture. Really old cinemas too. They've all gone now. Shops are moved in everywhere. But that's just the way it is. Times change, Berlin gives in to lots of new trends, nothing stays as it is. When evening falls, the Kurfürstendamm changes as well, from a hectic shopping street into a real promenade. That's when you can really feel the atmosphere of the early years. The theaters bring life to the streets, adding yet another facet to the Kudam's unmistakable character. And that wraps up another week of Euromax. As always, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon.